Hello everyone, welcome to the paddock here in Singapore. It is night time, but it is still very, very warm. I'm joined by Ben Hunt. Uh, ben, I think weirdly the one place we need to start today is talking about swearing, isn't it? Yeah, pretty good, pretty interesting one to start with. Isn't yeah, it? I mean, Autosport Motorsport exclusive, of course, yeah. from, from the FIA president saying, you know, drivers shouldn't be swearing, it shouldn't be broadcast. We thought the story was moving along a little bit when Max spoke about it. He swore, in fact, he, he swore during during his press conference. In the press conference, didn't he? He yeah. used the F word. Yeah. Um, and it was quite noticeable that he did it. Um, you know, that was a live broadcasting event. So, um, you know, they were quite, you know, well, he was reminded about controlling his language um, in that and going forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was a, a couple of drivers at it today, weren't they? That is true, yeah. We had Kevin Magnussen, of course, yeah. swore during his media, uh, media session earlier on. Carlos Sainz, uh, just a few moments ago, saw in his media session. It's, it sounds quite a childish argument to have, but you asked the question, to be fair to you, to, to Max and to Yuki Sonoda, and his response, I thought, a very long answer from, from Max. Yeah. But what, did, what did you make of what he had to say? Yeah, I mean, he was saying that, um, you know, you, can't, you don't really want to dial the emotions out um, of, of Formula One, and, you know, that's pretty much how I feel about it as well. I think that, um, you know, I, I totally get that you've got to monitor what's absolutely broadcast because there are younger audience watching Formula One and they don't want to be hearing drivers swearing all the time. But it's that balance. You still want to have the emotion. I mean, you can still bleep it out or you can choose not to broadcast it. To broadcast all the swearing would be incorrect. Um, and it's about having that balance because you really want to have the characters. Um, you know, we don't get to see the, the drivers so much, you know, physically driving the car in the way the current Formula One cars built. So you, you don't get to see the characteristics and what they're really like. Um, when you hear the emotion over the, over the radio, I think that all adds into the picture. Um, and so, yeah, they were saying, you know, in other sports, you know, football and... Yeah. Um, Can you imagine you know, it in football? <laughs> yeah, plenty of swearing going on in football, but they're not mic'd up. Yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it does, you know, the microphones around the stadium do pick up the swearing. Yeah. Um, and it's always quite noticeable when that's dialed out and on the, the TV. And the will always then apologise or if something's picked up, I guess. Exactly. They? So they, when they do hear it, and they always have to apologise um, for the swearing, because obviously you can't control the fans, etc. But of course, with the drivers, there is a lot of emotion going on, um, you know, behind the behind the wheel, uh, a lot of frustration. Yeah. And so they are venting. That's what they're doing. Um, you know, I think that it was quite interesting. There's that side to it. I think swearing in press conference probably is going too far. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, that's not a stressful environment. Yeah, it's not usually at the moment situation, is it, I guess? It's not, but. and it's usually just a, you know, a press discussion. So I think the swearing in those sort of circumstances is um, you know, pretty off limits and they shouldn't be doing it, but I've got no real issue with it actually you know, mid-race for frustrations and tempers. So. Uh, I was in with Lando earlier on. We, we asked him about it because it was just after the press conference, and he basically said, for, for him, he used it a way of almost emphasis. Yeah. So if he's talking to the team, he's not just going to say, oh, you know, this went particularly badly. He's going to get on the radio and, you know, he's going to F and blind if, if you, you know, to, yeah. to get his message across. He also suggested, I don't know what you think about this, that maybe in the, in the modern era of interactive TV, you could have just a simple, whether it's a red button job that says, oh, I want the radio, I want the full access to the radio or I want a PG version of the radio. And there are workarounds for it that keep the access to what they want to watch. I think that is, Something that's doable. Um, let's see, we, we mentioned Kevin Magnussen earlier on about him swearing. He's back this weekend. Yeah. He was banned last week. He obviously was one of the first drivers in a long time to have a race ban for after collecting his 12 penalty points. Yeah. He's back. He's got zero points now on his license. Can do what he likes. Agreement about this early, didn't we? Yeah. I mean, look, uh, it, I love Kevin. Um, I think that he's a really great personality that we were talking about before, um, and, and his ability to act and drive in the way that he does but um, him having a weekend off is a bit of a strange one I think that you know it was punishment for racking up those penalty points how did he spend his weekend off he was at home with the family I think that if I was a team boss I know he's leaving but I'd probably have him in the factory or you know helping out in the simulator in Italy or, or whatever even on you know helping Ollie Behrman um, yeah. you know during that race weekend in Baku. But uh, no, he had his feet up and I don't even know if he was watching at home, was he? No, we don't know. Well, maybe he had the swearing radio switch on. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting one though, isn't it? Like we were saying earlier on that, I, I think that when you come back from that ban, if you've had the 12 points, you should still be on an, a certain number of points. I know in football, again, we, the football analogy, if you've got a red card, you're spending, you come back, there's nothing. I think it's slightly different here in the sense that he's now a completely clean slate. So as you just said then, he can go about that's the phrase when he swore early on. Yeah. He can go out and drive how he wants and do what he wants yeah. because he's, he's back on zero. And I don't know if that's, the punishment's cleared away, you've done the ban, but maybe you come back on three or six points yeah. as, almost as a, 
we've got to keep our eye on you kind of thing. I don't know. Do you think that's doable, or should it, is it right that he comes back and he's straight down back on zero? I don't. I don't really. I have never really thought about it to be honest, because it's been a long term since someone's had a, a ban. Um, perhaps it should. I don't know. I don't really have a strong opinion, if I'm brutally honest. Well, then we'll take my word as red on that one. Where you will have a strong opinion, yeah. Daniel Ricciardo. Yeah. We, we hear it quite often that he's been told this is his last race to prove himself, but it does feel like there might be some legs to that this weekend. Yeah, I think that as time ticks by, it's inevitable as we get closer towards the end of the season. Red Bull have got to make a, a choice about next year, whether they go with Liam Lawson or Ricardo. It seems to be a straight choice between the two. You've got to say on recent performance, Daniel hasn't been doing it. Um, you know, Lawson still remains an unknown quantity, although he did fill in even at this race last year for Daniel and did really well. And, you know, we've seen enough to know that he's good enough for Formula One. We just don't know how he compares against Daniel. Yeah. Red Bull will be privy to all this information. I think it's a tough choice. You know, Christian Horner really likes um, Daniel Ricciardo. Has always said that he's always been his favourite driver um, that he's worked with. So there's obviously that going in Daniel's favour. But then, of course, I think the other aspect is Helmut Marco very much behind Liam Lawson. Um, you know, backing the uh, production line, the Young Driver program. Two different camps, but I think it boils down to if Daniel has a good weekend here this weekend, it will probably roll over to the next race. Yeah. Um, if he has a bad one, then perhaps it is time for someone to say, actually, we're going to go with Liam next year and just freeze everyone up. You know, we know where we're at and, you know, Daniel can factor in what he does next year because obviously he's not made any decisions or plans because he's obviously hoping to stay in Formula yeah. One. Um, but both of them need to know. And I think that's the point. We're getting to that cutoff point where a decision needs to be made. I'm going to put you on the spot with two questions. One, is it fair to, to be told almost on a race-to-race -race basis your future depends on this race? Does that not put too much pressure on a driver? Um, no, I think it does. It, it, it's entirely validated. We've had, you know, what, how many races are we into now? I mean, what is this, 14th race? 15, right? 14, 15, too many to count, too, but yeah, it's yeah. up there, isn't it? Um, we've had a lot of races this year and obviously last year as well. And, you know, we know where we're at. We know what he's able to deliver in that RB car. And it is time to make a decision. But... It does become difficult if he has a stonking race this weekend, wins, top three, whatever. It's very hard then for Red Bull to turn around and say, sorry, mate, we don't want you next year. Yeah. So I do think that it's fair to wait, but it's not fair to put that pressure and say this is the one that it does depend because we can make a decision after Sunday whether we're going to go with you or not. Second question, which one do you go for if you're, if you're the boss next year? I think Liam Lawson, personally. Um, I think he deserves his chance. I was really impressed when he filled in for Daniel, uh, when Daniel broke his uh, wrist. And uh, I, I thought, oh, it's hand, wasn't it? I, I, I was really impressed with what he did, his maturity. And also the fact that he's continued to turn up to races and do everything that's requested, all the simulator sessions. And I'm quite a big one for seeing progress. And I'd really love to see him in a car for next year. What about you? Yeah, I completely agree. And I wanted to just round it off by saying this year was the first time ever or maybe that the driver lineup hasn't changed it's correct yeah and that's just i think that's poor from this sport yeah. when there's so many talented rookies we, we're going to see that next year almost an influx of yeah. it next year with these guys coming on the grid i think that'll be fun i think those guys will be not happy to be here because that's a bit patronizing but mm -hmm. you know making the most of the opportunities in front of them yeah. will we see things like what we saw with kimi antonelli in monza of course we will but that's just going to have to be half the course isn't it these guys deserve their chance and yeah. to have had that pathway blocked this year for some of these guys it is disappointing. So next year, it, it could be fun. We could, we're going to have Liam Lawson potentially. We don't know who's going in the, the Sauber car yet. Yeah. Antonelli's coming in. Behrman's coming in. Yeah. So it could be a good year for the rookies. Yeah, I think so. It's all part of progress, isn't it? And the shape of Formula One, it's in quite good health, isn't it? When you see that these rookies coming through and able to deliver like last weekend with Colapinto and Behrman, you know, really delivering on a very tough, tough track like Baku was encouraging to see. Brilliant. Well, join us tomorrow. We'll go through what happened in free practice and talk about other people probably swearing, yes. but we won't be, so have a good evening. <laughs>